Fantastic. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Roz McCann. I'm a professor in environment and society at Utah State University. I have been working with permaculture design for a decade now. And uh, a decade ago, I also launched the USU Permaculture Initiative. And very excited to talk to you today about the topic in this very suiting day. It's Earth Day today. So happy Earth Day to everyone. And Hopefully every day is your Earth Day moving forward if it wasn't already. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll dive into permaculture. Okay, here we go. Perfect. So today we're going to, we have less than an hour together and ask, geez, what should I really focus on in all of the things we could talk about with permaculture? And I thought as an intro workshop, it'd be best to just go over the fundamentals of the permaculture framework itself, and then talk about some ways that this has been applied in Utah. And I've got a lot of examples from my town of Moab. So I'm, although I'm a USU Extension Specialist in Sustainable Communities, I'm based on the Moab campus. And I'll be showing you several examples from the Moab community area, and then also uh, the work we've been doing up in Logan. So a bit of a sit back and enjoy a, a tour the second half, but really a deep dive at the beginning into some of these fundamentals when it comes to permaculture design. How is it defined, how, the ethics, the principles, zones, sectors, et cetera. Okay, so here we go into the world of permaculture. So for the next little bit in, of our time together, the things I really want to highlight are the ethics and principles, of course. So permaculture differs from typical landscape design in that it is based around and uses as checkpoints these ethics and principles. And so there's not only a human client of what our wants and needs are, but an earth client as well that we're designing for and with. And so we are designing ourselves away from this more parasitic relationship that we've had as humans with our environment into one that is more mutualistic and even better regenerative. And then I'll talk a little bit about zones, sectors, patterns, design elements, and of course, being in the second driest state in the nation, although this year is definitely an anom anomaly, uh, I want to talk a little bit about water harvesting. And so uh, learning what our potential is when it comes to water harvesting on our landscapes. And then I'm going to end with those Utah examples. So giving you some, some visual examples of what could be done when we apply the permaculture framework to a landscape. Okay, here we go. So I have a major goal for the next little bit together, and that is to help guide our collective sh shift away from linear to integrated or system ecosystem thinking. So it's, it's more thinking about all the components and the interconnectivity of that, and away from this linear thinking of a monoplanted landscape, for example, pulling from municipal water and uh, relying on external inputs to constantly feed your system. Instead, how can we work with what works in nature to better design landscapes that are uh, perennial food producing that don't require as many inputs if, or ideally no inputs uh, in the long term. So that is our my goal for us together is to guide this shift of thinking away from linear towards more integrated thinking. So I have a question for you all to get started. And I think that you can use the chat function uh, or the Q&A, whatever you're, you have available to you in this webinar. But I'm curious what the term permaculture means to you. It really helps for me to get a foundation of where my audience is at and what to dive more deeply into to see what you know about permaculture. And if you're like, I just heard the term, it sounded interesting, but I have no idea what it was or what it is, that's totally fine as well. Just go ahead and put in a message what the term means to you. We'll take a second for that. Okay, so I see the chat is uh, disabled, but put it in the Q&A then for me. And I see some of you are doing this, fantastic. Growing food in the city, yeah, we often see permaculture applied to urban landscapes and you can do a lot in a small space. So that is one way that permaculture is applied is in urban settings. Uh, more earth-friendly methods for growing food and caring for resources, fantastic. Harmony with the land and production and harvest. Can I use this type of gardening to replace current lawn? Excellent question. What often happens with permaculture 
uh, as people are dabbling into that and want to replace their lawns as they apply what's called lasagna landscaping or lasagna gardening. I'm not going to go in depth of what lasagna gardening is today, but just uh, put a little nugget there for, for your thought process, maybe some Google searches later about what lasagna gardening, gardening is. And that's a great way to uh, replace lawn without all of the labor required to do so. So decomposing that uh, lawn through applying cardboard, leaf litter and uh, compost, et cetera, soil on top. And that uh, decomposes that under layer and they can start to plant within that. And of course, though shaping earthworks first and foremost would be most important. A diverse amount of plants, vegetation in the space. I'm familiar with this concept and want to learn. Tessia, thank you for that. Um, low to no impact, regenerative, no-till, fantastic. Thank you for that insight. Um, looks like we have ecosystem gardening. Great, I love seeing these comments, growing food and landscaping together, working with landscapes and ecosystems instead of against them. Nice, and I really, and I think you just hit a nail on the head there with your comment, because oftentimes as we think about what's happening to our planet, we can feel a sense of anxiety. And uh, really that comes with feeling in a sense of disconnect with the way our planet functions. And What's great about permaculture is we're designing ourselves as a regenerative component within that. So we're making tweaks in the landscape that are more in harmony with how nature works. And also we, as an effect, aren't so much a parasite on our own landscape, but instead are working in a more mutualistic or regenerative fashion. Establishing small ecosystem for mutual benefit. Great, I love these. I'm gonna take a closer look at these later, but this gives me a good feel of where we have some beginners, some that seem to have a good grasp on the regenerative capacity of permaculture. And so hopefully I'll, I'll touch on enough information to really peak all of this range of experience that is here on the call today. Okay, so let's go through just the basics of what permaculture is. So uh, permaculture was first coined in 1978. I'm very careful about saying that it was coined then and not developed in 1978 because permaculture, a lot of the techniques and the framework that permaculture is founded in is based off of indigenous knowledge from various communities across the globe. And those tools and techniques have been in practice for thousands upon thousands of years. So that, that is part a big part of the permaculture design framework. But what's exciting as well is that it not only gives this strong nod to indigenous knowledge, but it also combines with uh, Western scientific thinking or, or understanding. And so it's a bridging of those two worldviews into a framework for effective positive change. It's also a way of seeing the world, taking responsibility for the impacts associated with meeting one's basic needs. And it's often defined as a self-supporting design for tomorrow. So it's a design framework for us to work from. There's three major ethics in permaculture that guide the design process. And the first and foremost, care for the earth, care for people. And the last one is coined very uh, different ways, uh, depending on which practitioners you're talking to, but the general gist is fair share or reinvesting in surplus. And so when you have a yield, sharing that among your community and uh, and then also creating this network, a giving economy uh, as part of your yield that you're seeing. So it's definitely the permaculture world is uh, hard for people to get a grasp of because it's defined in so many different ways. I conducted a national research study on it a couple of years ago and was just um, really confirmed the fact that people struggle with how to define it, but there are some common threads of what permaculture is that I've um, found from my research. So the first is that there's, uh, there's these three ethics that always stand out in permaculture, earth care, people care, fair share, and a set of guiding principles that help us as a checklist in our design to see how well we're doing at working towards those ethics. And it does require a more systems level way of thinking. So integrated worldview thinking, as opposed to a more linear thinking that a lot of our landscapes tend to be designed with. And what is common in definitions is that it is a bridging of this ecological knowledge, Western science and creative applications based on context specific needs and resources. So uh, that bridging is something that is commonly accepted in the permaculture world, Western science, indigenous knowledge. So uh, three more commonalities that I've seen in definitions of permaculture. It, the principles help individuals and communities regenerate ecosystems rather than degrade them. 
And we in permaculture work from patterns to details. So observing patterns in nature, patterns in our thought process, finding leverage points for change and designing from those patterns into the details of a design. And then lastly, uh, we bear a responsibility for giving back to the land and our communities. And this is also referred to as the prime directive in which we take responsibility for our needs and impacts. So there's some commonalities in permaculture. If you're like, wow, this is a lot to take in at once. I found two definitions that are really brief that I really resonate with and I'll share them with you now. So the first is from the Permaculture Institute and the second from Occidental Arts and Ecology Center. And I'll just give you a second to read those and let them resonate with you a little bit. Okay, so this is some big picture stuff when we talk about these broad definitions of permaculture, the framework itself, and we're going to keep on this um, big level to start the presentation before we hone in on those specific examples I want to show you of how we apply this in the landscape situation. So this is an image from David Holmgren about the three ethics that you see there in the middle of permaculture and then his set of principles. And I say his because sometimes people add a few principles, but generally this is the gist of the permaculture principles. The first and foremost is observe and interact. So this is a really important principle because it, uh, it has a slow down sit in our landscape and make observations through the eyes of a child. So instead of making observations with a designer's eye of, oh, I should fix that, or this is uh, something that I wanna move or whatever it is that comes to mind, it's actually more uh, trying to not get in that thought process and just innocently observe. What are you seeing? What, what colors are you seeing? How does it feel on your landscape? And uh, you know, in different spots of your landscape, what noises are you hearing? those types of observations that are going to then really be helpful in your design process. Maybe you're starting to see some places that have a beautiful view, some places that has a view that you want to block. Maybe there are certain uh, components of your landscape that are much more windy than others, and there's an opportunity to keep that wind coming in or to block that wind. So you can see how those observations will really help guide your thought process or design process. And ideally we observe for about a year before actually starting the design process. A lot of times in reality, that's not possible. And so ways that you can get to this observe and interact principle is by asking people in your community that have lived there for a long time, where do the storm winds come from? And what kind of animals do you see in landscapes here? Are there a lot of deer in town or things like that? And uh, you know how hot is it generally in the summer and in the winter? Um, rain events. What what does that look like? You know, are there is there a lot of rain at once, or is it more uh, spread out over the the rainy season, etc.? So that's a way that you can shorten that observe. Uh, principles by talking to your neighbors, talk to people who have lived there for longer than you have, and then these are the other principles. I'm not going to go in depth just because of time for today's. Uh, time we have together, but you can find these uh, in many places online and uh, learn how to apply them as you work on your own designs for your landscapes. Okay, so how the process works for permaculture. First, as I mentioned, long and slow observation. And then from that long and slow observation, we develop a goal for our landscape and make sure that's a realistic goal. So for me, I, I am pretty busy with work and I don't uh, have time and energy for an entire annual garden. It's just not the way I want to garden. It's too intensive uh, for, for my capacity as a homeowner. And so my goal for my own landscape is to design a very diverse perennial edible landscape that my kids and I can walk through and forage as we're hanging out in our backyard. And that also then provides a shade layer for a cooling effect because it's Moab and it gets really hot in the summer. So that would be my overarching goal for my landscape. And then from your design, what I suggest for people, especially in Utah, is to start at the top of your landscape. And that makes people pause for a second. I'm like, what's the top of my landscape? It's the top of your roof. So when rainwater hits your roof, and it flows from that roof down your the sides of your roof and whether it to a gutter or sheet flow off your roof into your landscape, that is where you start with your design. And because we want to start with water, we want to slow spread sink water on our landscape in the 
Western world landscapes are often designed to push rainwater away as a nuisance as fast as possible, which astounds me living in a state that is su has such a water crisis like ours. And there's such an opportunity to slow spread sink rainwater into our landscape. So I, I start with that water flow. When it comes down the gutter, to intentionally sink that into indented swales basins that will soak it in into the landscape or into a tank system. I have both. So I have a tank in my backyard that's 750 gallons. I'll show you a picture of that in the slides later on. And uh, from that tank system, I gravity feed water in times of drought to the plants that most need that in my backyard, like my plum tree. And I've got an apple tree that I use rainwater for, and also uh, some garlic and that in a garden bed that I have near our social circle. So start at the top. Start small. We can get really excited about permaculture design and then watch just revamp our entire backyard or tear out our entire lawn and put everything in at once and you'll quickly burn yourself out. So uh, it's really helpful to start small, see what works well, and then repeat that pattern in other parts of your landscape. And then I recommend to, of course, to constantly be thinking through the water process. So ways to slow spread, sink that through your landscape through a series of swales that will overflow into the next. If you're harvesting in a tank system, have an intentional overflow because it will overflow. My 750 gallon tank overflows often, especially this year. And you'll want that overflow to direct into an intentional area. Mine feeds into a yarrow that then overflows into a box elder tree. And uh, so yeah, that's the next point of planning for overflow and manage it as a, as a resource and minimize your living or max, minimize, maximize your living and organic ground cover. I use wood mulch often as my uh, main mulch material and uh, for my main pathway in my backyard, I have patio stones. In between those stones, I have a variety of thyme, low growing thyme species uh, and primarily woolly thyme, which is a great uh, edible uh, flower. So it's a pollinator attractor. It's a soft ground cover that's more drought resistant than uh, something like Kentucky bluegrass. And you can also cut it and use it in your kitchen for culinary purposes. So. That's a lot of stacked functions there with one planting that I have in my backyard. And to continually reassess your system. I'm doing that right now. We're making some changes in our backyard because uh, we are no longer pulling into our orchard irrigation for water. We're cutting off from that to decrease our water de dependence and uh, instead pulling more from our rain tank. And that's resulting in some earthworks changing in our backyard. So. Don't think that you'll, your design will be a one and done. There will always be certain changes or tweaks you'll want to make. Okay, so I mentioned designing from patterns to details. This is such a fascinating thing that once you start to see, if you haven't been paying attention to this, that it, it will definitely change the way you view both nature, but also your daily life. So there's, of course, patterns in nature. We see this spiral pattern very often. There's spirals in the way that uh, petals grow in a flower or seeds grow in the middle of a flower. And of course, hurricanes are that spiral pattern. The, and this is all related to the Fibonacci sequence, the mathematical sequence that's this uh, golden ratio spiral pattern. And that can be useful in design for creative pathways that uh, potentially are indented, like an indented herb spiral that has a pathway circling around the spiral where you have minimal path but maximum access to plants. We did that with the Logan, the main campus permaculture garden, an indented herb spiral. But there's also relationship patterns in our lives, communities that we tend to uh, engage most closely with patterns in the way that we connect with our communities, our own thought patterns, habits, behaviors, our patterns in society, settlement patterns. So really any of these patterns can help guide our design process. And um, there's very creative ways that permaculturalists have done this. So keyhole gardens are designing from a, a pattern to a detail in a garden design is another example. Uh, one thing that I've been doing to shift my pattern, especially in the winter 
uh, January can be hard for a lot of us. And I realized that when I wake up, I immediately think about how tired I am with my three-year-old uh, being scared of monsters and waking up in the night a lot or uh, how I have so much to do at work. So all these negative thoughts are how I have been starting my day. And instead, what I've been doing to shift that thought pattern is writing three things down as soon as I wake up that I'm grateful for. It's a gratitude journal. It's super quick. Uh, so I, I wake up and I immediately think, what are three things that I'm grateful for today? Well, the trees are looking beautiful in the backyard in full bloom, or the robins are singing, I can hear that. And, uh, you know, my kids, even though he's having monster dreams, he's super sweet, sleeping, wanting to cuddle next to me. And so I'll write down those things in my gratitude journal, and then it really can shift the way that your whole day is by starting off on a more positive note. So that's an example from uh, re recognizing a pattern implementing a shift to then uh, change your daily behaviors. Here's an example more uh, tangible for you all to see. So we can see and probably have a good idea of what shaped this pattern, right? So water and a lot of water coming through, which happens in the desert where I'm at very often. You have a rain event, that water tears through in a flash flood and deepens and uh, shapes these canyons. And this was a similar pattern that we observed at the old USU Moab campus before we moved to the new campus. And this uh, canyon style of these buildings coming together with these huge roof surfaces and then this narrow walkway. So you have a lot of water coming into a small spot, just like in one of these canyons. And we negotiated with the neighboring building to have gutters and downspouts put in. And those tanks are called slimline tanks uh, from bush tank systems. And they are connected with an underground pipe. And we have a total water harvesting capacity of uh, 2,000, uh, I think it's over 2,000 gallons that we then attach a hose to that purple irrigation box opens and a hose attaches and we can water the north permaculture garden or the south side has a irrigation box as well that we attach a hose to and can water the south permaculture garden. You can see some of that garden there in the very back of the photo. And the overflow is intentional. I'm standing, the garden's behind me from where I'm taking this picture, but that overflow flows into where the swale starts to form for that north garden and flows away behind me in this picture. So that's an uh, example of making use of uh, the way the pattern is in the landscape and designing into the details to maximize our water harvesting potential here. Okay, so I can't do permaculture justice without talking about zones and sectors. So zone planning is a system where the location of an element is determined by how often we use it and how often we service that element. And so what this means practically is, uh, well, first of all, I'll just say that these zones are often pictured like you see here in circular fashion, but in our landscapes are definitely not that way. Uh, instead, what happens in our landscape that we want to move away from is we put our most intensive plants, the plants that need the most love and care, usually in a garden in the back corner of the landscape. And it's somewhere that we don't naturally walk by every day. And as a result, we might not notice when aphids have infected our broccoli or our irrigation lines broken because it's out of sight and often out of mind. Instead, how zone thinking helps us get away from that. Uh, design flaw is we look at the the patterns of our um, our movement on a landscape every day. So our zone zero is a house and then your zone one would be walking in between two areas that you walk every day like from your house to your garage or your house to your chicken coop, your house to your bike shed, whatever that is. And that walking path is the most intensive ideally where the most intensive plants you plant will be located. So if you're walking to your chicken coop, wouldn't it be great to have planted edibles along that path that you can grab on your way, throw into your chickens, on the way back to your kitchen, you're grabbing a few more salad greens, et cetera, some herbs to use in the kitchen as you're walking back to your house and can cook from that. So those intensive plants ideally are near that walking path where you can just bend down and grab them and use them right then and there in your day-to-day -day life. So that is an example of zone thinking all the way out to zone five, which is more a wild zone in an urban setting for many of us, that's not possible. 
Uh, my zone five is my community owned forest that I have here in Moab. We live in a walking, biking only community and there's a community owned community garden space, community orchard and community forest in our neighborhood. And so that orchard forest space into the forest space is really the zone three through five of my own, what I consider my own residence, even though my yard itself is, uh, is a tenth of an acre, but I expand those zones out to my broader community. And uh, so my landscape in immediately is like zone one through three, I would say, because it's so small. Okay, yes, they're abstract boundaries as well. And I'm sure you've had a chance to read some of the slides that I'm talking. Oops, let me go back one real quick. So yeah, I mentioned they're not hard boundaries. They're more delineated by our pathways, et cetera, that we uh, engage with our landscape and, uh, and how we want to interact with our landscape. They can definitely blend into each other. So there's not like a specific plant palette for zone one and then one for zone two, et cetera. So plants can definitely blend in between zones uh, as, as well. You can have garlic planted under your orchard trees in your zone four, for example, or something like that. And yeah, they're not circular, but like I mentioned, and we can apply zone thinking to, to social systems as well. It's a super fun activity to, to draw out in circles who your who's in your zone one, who's in your zone two, all the way out to the zone five is the global community. But then you might notice certain things. Maybe there's someone in your zone one that you wish you didn't talk to every day who, and you, you could come up with ideas of how to create more space in your life from that person who's maybe draining some of your energy. Or there's someone in your zone three that you wanna bring into your zone one and you could come up with ideas of how to make those shifts happen as well. Super fun to apply this on a social scale. Okay. So come in for air for a second because I'm going through this stuff pretty fast, but sectors is the other major thing I wanted to share. And I've already talked some about this, so I don't need to spend too much time, but this is where long and slow observation can reveal these sectors. And so sectors are a range of factors on your landscape, including wind, sun, noise, pollution, views, wildlife, fire and water, and identifying these sectors through mapping them out. This is one example of how to map them out on your landscape. So uh, here we see the red in the top that says high or hot summer winds come from that direction towards the house. And then um, we have other examples of a fire sector on this landscape, et cetera. And so you can map this out and figure out uh, whether you, these are things you're drawing in or wanting to draw in or wanting to block. So you can do this through printing out a Google map of your own landscape and drawing on it. That's really a fun thing to do. If you're not as artistic or can't draw to scale like me, I can't draw to scale. And so now we've, we're going from these big pictures and I'm gonna start bringing us in now to design elements. So what we do is once we've identified uh, our goal and we've gone through this zone and sector analysis, we then have an idea of the major design elements we wanna put in our landscape. So if my goal is to grow more perennial edibles on my landscape, maybe I wanna put a cherry tree in my yard because I love cherries, love the flowers and uh, and, and so I, I decide I, that's the plant I'm going to pick to start with. And you don't want to do this with every single element in a permaculture design because you'll make yourself a little crazy, but it's super helpful for especially larger elements. So with a cherry tree, what you would do is think through what are the needs of that tree? And so, of course, there's the basic needs we can all think of right away, sunshine, water, it needs some nutrients in the soil. It needs pollination to bear fruit, et cetera. And then what does it produce? It provides fruit. It provides a wind block. It uh, provides oxygen for us. So it helps improve our air. It draws down greenhouse gases as a perennial plant. And uh, so there's all of these benefits that we see that the fruit tree is producing. And so we know, let's say that the, our cherry tree is uh, in need of nitrogen. So instead of constantly having to go each year and buying synthetic nitrogen and applying that to our landscape, are there other design elements we can put in around our cherry tree that help fill that need? So if it needs nitrogen, perhaps we're planting around that tree as part of our guild system, nitrogen fixing plants that then will feed the root systems of that tree and provide that uh, on a, per a perennial basis that we don't have to come back every year and feed more nitrogen to that tree. So that's just a quick example of a needs and benefits activity for 
things in our landscape that are major elements of the design. Okay, so now let's talk about more specific design elements. It's, uh, just looking where I'm at for time. Okay, perfect. So I'm about right on where I want it to be time-wise to make sure you have time to get to your next talk. So I mentioned that I used wood mulch often as my main ground cover layer. I really like using mulch. What I've learned over time though, is I don't wanna use wood mulch where I walk barefoot out of my house every day because I get splinters in my feet. And so I'm making some tweaks to my landscape around that, uh, learning that the hard way over the last five plus years. So the benefits, though, of planting wood mulch around your landscape, I found a fact sheet by Colorado State University Extension that lists great benefits of wood mulch for uh, ground cover. So wood mulch reduces evaporation from your soil surface and can cut water use by 25 up to 50 percent by a thick woody mulch layer. And this type of organic mulch promotes soil microorganism activity, which in turn improves soil till, and it also helps lessen soil compaction. And uh, with that, I already mentioned the soil moisture thing, but uh, it definitely helps stabilize soil moisture, meaning that it uh, keeps your soil moist over longer periods of time. Oops, I didn't mean to do that, sorry. And it also controls weeds, which rob soil moisture as well. So it doesn't definitely bind weed will eventually find its way through um, various parts of your wood mulch, but it helps decrease the amount of weeds you have by a thick application of that on your landscape. And it also helps moderate your soil temperature extremes, which is super helpful for um, our happy plants. And then controls soil erosion in a rain event. And lastly, it gives it a finished look as well. So there's this whole range of benefits to wood mulch in a landscape. And oftentimes we can contact our local city, county and find someone who has wood mulch for free and get that uh, brought to our landscape and we go pick it up and bring it to our own landscape or you can buy it from different landscape uh, companies or nurseries, et cetera. Okay, so let's go into the next part of ground cover that I mentioned earlier, the woolly thyme. So this is a uh, photo examples of woolly thyme applied in landscapes and uh, woolly thyme is, like I mentioned, it's soft. It's a pollinator attractor. There's culinary uses to woolly thyme. It's relatively drought tolerant once it's established as well. And so just to give you an example, my pathway, this isn't a picture of my backyard, but it is a close example of those flagstones that I mentioned that I have in my backyard with woolly thyme in between. So there's thinking a way outside of the Kentucky bluegrass box for everyone. So water, I mentioned I had to get a nod to water. And uh, when we think about water on our landscapes, what we often see is this Salt Lake City neighborhood uh, designed like this, where we have very water intensive grasses planted as the dominant landscaping uh, plant. And then we have roofs that have a gutter system here, asphalt roofs that are pulling rainwater down in the gutter system to a, uh, a paved driveway that is slanted towards the street in a storm system to push that away as quickly as possible instead of slow spreading that water on a landscape. Here we see an example, the middle photo of rainwater coming down a gutter and then it goes through this, uh, this screen cover over the sidewalk, like a, almost like a rifle barrel there and shoots it out the other side. And that's actually causing a problem. So how do we turn this problem of rainwater flowing into the landscape into a solution? This is common permaculture thinking. Well, we can definitely start our swale system there um, by slowing, spreading, sinking that water into an indented swale system that then is growing things that we actually will engage with on our landscape, like edibles or shade cover, a spot to sit and read a book, et cetera. And so this is a great opportunity of a, a place to start a swale system on a landscape. This is also a photo from Salt Lake City in a major rain event, just seeing all that water on impervious surfaces flowing and swirling away into the storm drain. And some of that, of course, for Salt Lake uh, recharge is extremely important, but when you're, you're flushing that much water in an urban setting so quickly down the storm drain system, you're flushing a ton of pollutants as well and have erosion potential when, when it's that large amount. So there's ways that we could do curb cuts and dented basins to slow spread sink through effective green infrastructure in urban settings. 
as well. And I'm working so with City of Moab on that. So let's look at what that looks like. And this is an example from Brad Lancaster's books, uh, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. They look like this. They're amazing guides for ways to slow spread sink water in our landscapes. And he just came out with a fully uh, color version, uh, new editions of those volumes one and two. So this is an example of a typical landscape, right? So we have a sheet flow coming off the roof. We have the landscape sloped towards the street. And we don't have a lot of water slow spread sink, slowing spreading sinking on the landscape. And the plants, in fact, that tree in the corner there is mounded up. So water is actually flowing away from the, the root system as opposed to getting into the root system of that tree. Here we see a redesign of that landscape to better infiltrate water and make use of rainwater in an effective way. So uh, House Bill 36 in 2013 allows for rainwater harvesting in Utah of up to 2,500 gallons at a time, either in above ground or below ground tanks. And so we can all harvest per parcel at one time up to 2,500 gallons. We could use it, fill up again in the next rain event, use it. It's just at one time, no more than that amount. So uh, oftentimes people are confused like, oh, that's per year. I can only harvest 2,500 gallons. No, that's per uh, one time on a parcel. And so this is an example here. If you can see my mouse, that rainwater is coming down. It's flowing along the gutter system into the tank. And then the overflow goes into the root system of this tree. And then we have a gravity fed system with a host, the zone one intensive near the front door. And then water is flowing off the sidewalk into indented basins. We have a curb cut here, pulling in street water runoff into this tree that will then shade the street, draw down carbon, reduce urban heat island effect, and potentially also produce food if it's a mesquite or something like this. These pictures are from Tucson. And uh, here we have another example of water flowing in to an indented basin to water this tree. So this is integrated thinking, this is linear thinking. How, what is the potential of rainwater harvest on your own property? Let's see how our time is. I think I can do it. Okay, so this, if nothing else, take a picture of it with your phone and you can run the calculation later, but I will challenge you all to try a calculation right now uh, using Salt Lake City's average annual precip. So in Salt Lake, we see an average annual precip of 18.57 inches. I'm pulling my phone out to do the calculation with you all. How we do this calculation, which tells us in uh, this much rain and a year in Salt Lake, this much precip, how much water can we harvest off of a roof? So this, let's pretend our roof is very small. Let's say we're living in an 800 square foot space. Our roof is a thousand square feet. So an extremely small roof, just for ease sake. So first we take 18.57 divided by, we have to do the brackets first of this equation. So divided by 12, and that gets us uh, 1.54. And then we times that by a thousand, which is our roof area, to get our equation into gallons from that precip, we times it by point, or 7.48, I apologize. And then the runoff coefficient is a very, a helpful number. It's a, I use a very conservative runoff coefficient. What that means is the amount of water that actually stays on your roof and goes into your tank. So there's a certain amount you'll lose, right? Water hits your roof, it bounces off or it evaporates. I say, this is really conservative, but I used a 0.8. So we have 80% retention of water that hits our roof and goes into our tank. So we'll times our number by 0.8. And we see that a year in Salt Lake with the average precip, we could be harvesting on a small roof of a thousand, um, a thousand square feet, 9,260 gallons of rainwater. So a huge potential. And it quickly tells you that we can be doing much more than a rain barrel, which is my next slide. So uh, this is an example of a rain barrel on a landscape. There's several problems with this picture. One is the rain barrels not covered. And so we have an issue of algae growth from solar penetration and then also mosquito breeding grounds right here. And then there's also no overflow of the rain barrel, which is definitely gonna overflow. And that overflow should intentionally be going into one of the garden beds. 
And those are the major issues that I see for this rain barrel immediately. There's other issues we could point out. But here's an example of my rain barrel or my rain tank on my property. It's 750 gallons, like I mentioned. It's a plastic tank that's clear. And I told my husband we had to cover it because of uh, algae growth. And I thought we'd throw a shade cover over it, but he's a builder and designer. And this is what he did, which is amazing. It's beautiful, but it's definitely more elaborate than I would have uh, done if I did it myself. And so this is river cobble that we harvested from uh, the bowling alley in Moab, where a lot of locals get their rocks from. The side of the tank, we have a uh, wood beam support system underneath of leftover from our construction, and then diamond lath around that. And we plastered earthen plaster with chopped straw in that as the tank cover. And then the top is re leftover roof materials from our neighbors uh, with their metal roof. And then the cedar shake siding someone put up on Moab Classifieds for free. So a lot of upcycled materials there. This is called a rain head. I love rain heads for leaf litter diversion. It has a large screen here, so bigger stuff can flow off. And you can see, like right here, it's more visible instead of a flat rain shield or leaf shield. A flat one, you're not gonna see as easily as you're walking by, but the slanted one, as I'm walking by, I can just quick wipe uh, that off with my hand and easier is always better for me because of my busy work schedule. And there's a smaller screen inside you have to occasionally uh, filter out or clean out. So um, that takes out the finer debris, but that's called a rain head. And then my overflow is on the back side, and that's what goes to the yarrow and then the cherry tree. You can see here this lever, it's really just a corner of it. That's where I attach my hose and water my backyard. Okay, now we're going to do our photo tour of uh, things we've done through the permaculture initiative. So I keep saying we, Jake Powell in landscape architecture and environmental planning at USU, helps run the permaculture initiative with me. And we have a team of professors that engage on and off with the permaculture initiative and a slew of students and AmeriCorps interns at this point. And so uh, launched that, like I said, in 2013, we had a space on the Logan campus that was degraded Kentucky bluegrass, compacted gravel type soil. And it had a set of rubber trees that looked really unhealthy. And in fact, when we dug them up and we eventually got permission from facilities to dig up the rub rubber trees, they still had wire caging around the root balls. And so that was really unfortunate. I'm not sure uh, who made that mistake planting those trees, but uh, that was what we had to work with originally on the Logan campus for the site that we had designated, which is right behind Aggie Ice Cream. So that was the launch of the permaculture initiative. I'll show you a picture in a minute of the Logan campus. So now in the last couple of minutes together, uh, we are going to breeze through some of these photos to give you a taste of permaculture in action, and then hopefully I'll have time to answer some questions. So this is the old USU Moab campus. My office was basically, my view was out this window. When I arrived in Moab in 2013, they were repaving the parking lot, and they were tearing out these juniper beds as part of the parking lot re repaving. And the original plan was to put in raised flower beds of one to two species on a drip line, and I am a communications professor, so I used, I figured out how to speak the language of the executive director of the campus and approached him, at the time was him, and said, we really pride ourselves at Utah State with innovation in the classroom, inspiring students with uh, state-of-the-art teaching and, and application of teaching in research settings. Why, when they come to the landscape, would they want to see a monoplanted landscape in one of two species of flowers? Wouldn't it be amazing if we were growing a diverse ecosystem type approach to something innovative like permaculture design? He was so excited about the idea, he turned the budget over to me, which terrified me at the time because I am a social scientist, I'm not a hands-on designer, but I do know how to bring teams of people together. And so brought in a permaculture designer, hired an intern to help with the initiative. We brought in a lot of community members because I was brand new to the community, didn't have a year to observe the landscape. I had to work with, around the USU schedule. And uh, we created an amazing space based on community input, the permaculture designer skills and my intern's assistance as well. And so we took out a lot of parking lot and put in uh, paradise. And uh, now the building runoff on the north end of this building flows under a side, the sidewalk into this swale system that's rock lined. And we have a broad array of plants planted. The overstory is almost entirely food producing. I say almost because here you can see, well, the ashes we kept 
these large ash trees that were providing shade uh, and also noise block from this busy street, main street over this way. But this tree here is a mimosa, that's a nitrogen fixing tree. And then here we have various fruit trees, cherry, peach, et cetera, in the front side of the landscape. Here are the little grapes that we planted to grow up the pergola, which now has a upcycled table under it of, of wood from a building torn down on Main Street and upcycled bike parts. And the grapes provide shade in the summer over the top and then filtered light and warmth in the winter when we don't want that shade cover. So that's a great way of stacking functions there. And of course, you can stand on the picnic table and pull grapes off of the vines and eat those now. This is a few years back of how much that space has grown. This space is watered less than 10 times on average a year with municipal water. So it's almost entirely rainwater fed. So here we see this gutter system for the neighboring Walker, Walker Warehouse and that downspout going straight into the garden. There's another downspout around here that goes straight in. And then we have that connected slimline tank system behind me that feeds in times of drought. And then we rely on municipal water after all of that. Here's some edible currants growing in the foreground. We have grasses to stabilize soil along the swale. Uh, we have native pollinator tractor, nitrogen fixers, Apache plume is pictured right here, echinacea, and a uh, range of great pollinator species and edibles all intertwined in herbs into that landscape now. This is an example of that picnic table with upcycle bike parks. In the parking lot, we put in more shade islands because it's very hot to park in a very large open uh, asphalt parking lot like the campus was. And so those take parking lot runoff and soak it in to the swale system. And then we're growing fruitless mulberry, uh, another ash, uh, desert willow, and a hackberry to provide shade for cars. Here's the tank install and here's along the street that water flows down the swale system around the corner and the eventual overflow is where that car is leaving campus and flows towards Pack Creek. And in the rare event, we do see an overflow now, instead of that being a rush of all the parking lot overflow, that water is filtered and cleaner as it goes through the overflow system. But it soaks in so well near the creek system and recharges the aquifer to the point that we rarely see an overflow out of those gardens. Now the campus has been sold and bought by the Free Health Clinic in Moab. They were extremely excited about the permaculture gardens. We trained them about what was in the gardens, how we've been caring for them. And luckily one of their uh, main staff members was a permaculture intern in California and is very excited about the gardens and is continuing these uh, to care for these gardens as they're, they were designed. And so this is an example of the community that came out for that work, the planting day, and we got everything planted in a day because of the amount of hands we had helping. Range of people living without any money, the free money tribe to professors, students, professionals in the community. It was just amazing to see all walks of life come out to assist with that planting. Uh, this looks like it could be somewhere deep in a forest system. This part of the old Moab campus is no longer or no wider than 12 or so feet wide. And yet it, I'm crouching near the ground and just it's this amazing diverse ecosystem in a small urban setting. This is a native pollinator house we built with uh, rundo reed that was requ is required to be taken out in Moab. They have, they're removing it as invasive species. And then this is leftover construction uh, wood from community rebuilds. And we built, we held a community workshop to build pollinator housing for our native pollinators. There's around 500 native bee species in the, the city of Moab limits alone. Moab, or Utah is an amazingly bee diverse state. And like everything in Moab, it's at full capacity uh, pretty immediately after we built it. These are the design plans for that campus to give you a feel of what a permaculture design looks like. And so here we see overstory food producing plum, sour cherry, et cetera, peach. But then the understory is more designed with patterns in mind. So we have pollinator tractors intentionally planned around the trees with nitrogen accumulators and nitrogen or nutrient accumulators and nitrogen fixers as well. So that we are filling these ecosystem functions intentionally through our plant choices. And then here's the plant list here on the side that we used in the gardens. This is in Tucson, uh, example of curb cutting. And here's another picture of the parking lot. 
And now I'm gonna breeze through a little faster because we're starting to get on the, the end of the hour. So this is that Logan Garden I told you about, the Kentucky bluegrass was in horrible shape, rubber trees weren't very happy and realized they were uh, still had wire caging around their root balls. And then this is how we redesigned the site with permaculture design and community input. So this is a wind tunnel and we planted an intentional uh, food forest, mini food forest to also serve as a wind block from the wind that swirls in here and swirls around. And we visually depicted that swirling wind through an indented herb spiral, spiral right around here that the nutrition dietetic students based in this building walk out and now harvest and use in their classroom. Couple pictures of the Logan Garden for you. This is a Hugo culture mound, which is buried wood that retains water, um, produces great fungal communities, and then also plants thrive better in Hugo mounds when they don't have a direct water system. And then that's right adjacent to this indented herb spiral. And then this is our zone one intensive closest to the nutrition dietetics door where we plant more intensive plants. Here's some of the harvest we get from that Logan Garden that used to be that Kentucky bluegrass space. This is my house in, in Moab that is, here's a community owned orchard and then forest behind, like I mentioned, there's now a house here and a house here, um, but this is a walking, biking only community. And this is all gray water fed landscaping. So when I shower, do laundry, it waters my fruit trees in the front. They don't have wire caging around them anymore. This one is about to explode its wire cage anyways. Uh, and this is a nectarine tree, two cherry trees, a peach tree, and then a range of edibles or pollinator tractors underneath that I don't water at all. It's just, I water through showering and then it waters my landscape. And that's what that looks like with the pipe at a 2% grade. We changed the gray water policy in Utah a couple of years ago to allow for these gravity fed systems that just, when I shower, it literally just comes out, drops down into the landscape and goes to the root system of the surrounding trees. And that looks like this. A Little bit of a wild jungle, but look at all that wonderful food. There's are all peaches there, lavender in the foreground, uh, daylilies that are edibles as well. This is a charter school in Moab. We took out a lawn and put in intentional rain uh, basins here, rock lined. And now this plum tree is massive and the kids just love to play back there. These are the kids planting. There's a whole series of events we did to involve the entire school in that planting event. Wabi Sabi thrift store. We created uh, roadside basins through curb cuts at Wabi Sabi and planted native plants there. They wanted a low maintenance garden design. And the Moab Arts and Rec Center, so now the city of Moab's catching on and is using this in some of the landscaping as well. Here's a community garden in Moab where it was super compacted soil that not even invasive species would grow on. And now we pull in street side runoff into these gardens. This is a Jeff Adams and Claire Core design of Terra Sophia. And that is growing a range of edibles from jujube to mulberry and a bunch of tea plants that they use to make tea with and hold workshops for the community around sustainability. This is a larger scale project that you can see uh, erosion happening from this large building into the landscape before. And then uh, Jeff came in and put in these, these earthworks to slow spread sink that water throughout the landscape. And now this is all planted as well. This is in Professor Valley. And then lastly, if you want to take a your phone and do a QR code of, or take a picture of this QR code or link. Um, this goes to our permaculture website and a bunch of resources for you if you want to explore these concepts more deeply. And so I'll give you a second to do that. And with that, I see some things happened in the chat and I wanna just see if I can address them in the last couple of minutes we have. Are we able to get the slides afterwards? I believe so, Sean, do you know? Yeah, if you just want to share them with Andrea, she'll get them posted to the website that they got the link from. Yeah, okay. So one person was asking how realistic those numbers are. So if we were to take a thousand square foot roof and go to a half inch rain event, you're still going to see several hundred gallons that you can harvest in one, in that one half inch rain event. So uh, you can really tweak these numbers. So it's not just the 18 inches that we did in our example down to a regular rain, one rain event and see what your water harvest potential is based on your roof size. And I really encourage you to do that. It's really fun and eye-opening to see. 
first flush diverter. I don't use a first flush diverter, but many people do. It's definitely helpful for keeping debris out of your tank. My tank, I didn't share, but there's four screws you can unscrew and then you open it up and you can access your tank to clean it out. And so you wanna make sure you can access your tank easily to clean it out if you need to, and it fills with debris. But that rain head does a really good job blocking all the large debris. It's just over time, I might need to flush out the sediment inside the tank. Good question. The books that I mentioned were Brad Lancaster's Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. This is the other one. I held up the green one earlier. So that is the book. And with that, I'll just say thank you, everyone. We had the goal today of moving away from linear thinking to more integrated systems style thinking. And here is my email. If you want to contact me with any questions from today's presentation, feel free to do so. And uh, on this Earth Day, I really hope that we can all think of ways to move forward each day to a more mutualistic, if not regenerative, relationship with our planet. So thanks, everyone. Good questions that you were putting in the chat as well. Thanks, Rosalind. That was amazing. Yes, sure thing.